two worlds collide. We have the spiritual, which many of us are seeking almost desperately to experience in our lives, the mystical, the miraculous, the magical. We want to be around people who are directly experiencing this and, and proving that um, that life is beyond ordinary, that uh, every day is an astral traveled adventure you know um the 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 idea that we can be truly magnificent enlightened beings now and still be here as a human going through contrast and then we have the other part of life that creates this inner conflict and that's the ordinary the mundane the everyday domestic existence that many of us find ourselves in. For the longest time, I had this inner conflict. Now, I grew up in a, a typically domestic experience, and that wasn't until my, my probably my 30s that I really started to seek this magical spiritual adventure. I wanted direct experience. I had spent a lot, a lot of time philosophizing and intellectualizing and overanalyzing and overthinking and um, and debating and and you know it was all mind based. And then I wanted to move into this direct experience. I wanted to really firsthand know what it was like to lead a magical, mystical life, to be spiritual. Now it's only recently that I have started to merge and integrate these two worlds so that I no longer have this inner parts conflict between spiritual and ordinary mundane life. And I believe that the saying chop wood carry water before enlightenment, chop wood carry water after enlightenment, chop wood carry water encompasses what I'm about to talk about really well. But essentially I wanted to share this because I don't think I'm alone here. <laughs> I, I believe that many of us are coming to the same conclusions. And what I've found is that if I'm experiencing a massive insight or revelation, then sure enough, there's a whole lot of people experiencing it around the same time, like a tipping point. And that's what I've witnessed, especially in the last few years with these big kind of insights of growth, transformation and evolution in our spiritual journeys. So I think Moving from realizing that the spiritual has to be integrated and become part of the mundane. So we want to bring these two worlds together because ultimately we are having a human experience. So while we're having a human experience, we're going to be within this three-dimensional reality, at least for now. And we're going to experience what we call contrast, polarity, duality. And so... Part, I believe, of integrating and merging the spiritual with the mundane is acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance of the shadows in our life experience. Acceptance of the idiosyncrasies and the traits that have been disempowering in our lives. Acceptance of the programming that have, that have um, led us into places of immense suffering. Acceptance of the repeated patterns and um, habits that keep getting us frustrated and um, feeling stuck. Acceptance of these things in ourselves and also acceptance of these things in others because ultimately we are one. And so if we're going to move into integrating, uh, into becoming a spiritual um, wood chopping, carrying human being, <laughs> moving to enlightenment, then I believe we have to accept that we are all one. And so we can't hurt ourselves anymore because we hurt the other. And so acceptance of these shadows, just as you would with a child who's, you know, screaming because they're in pain and they've hurt themselves, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't uh, judge them as having a shadow of, of rage or anger or sadness or fear. You would simply allow them to express the pain that they're experiencing so that it can pass. And I think we have to approach that with life. Acceptance of 
the shadow part of our human existence. And, and as we all know, when we start to accept something, we stop resisting it and we allow the natural uh, progression of release. So we do evolve and change and transform. But first we have to accept it. We have to see the elephant in the room in order to gently pull it out, lead it out of the room. And so I think for me, this struggle to move from uh, the ordinary into a spiritual life of miracles has been first realizing that I have to accept where I'm at. I have to accept who I am in this human experience. And that one of the biggest things that I had to realize was I can't spend my lifetime trying to fight my shadows, even trying to get rid of them for the pure purpose of getting rid of them because that still creates resistance. So that's where acceptance is key. The second step I found in really merging the spiritual with the mundane is this doing programming, which I've talked about so many times because it's been one of my core programs, this idea that we have to do, produce and achieve. And we miss out on the sacred parts of life if we're just living in pure survival, which is the do, produce, achieve mentality. It's the uh, mentality of someone who believes that they will not find love or fulfillment unless they prove themselves worthy. And again, I'll bring us back to the metaphor of a child. A child doesn't need to prove themselves worthy of love. So at what point did you stop becoming a child in that way? And so we've got to stop trying to prove our worth here in the world. We need to stop that because we're missing out on play. We're missing out on play. And play is how we increase our energy in the first place. It's it's how we increase our, dy our dynamic nature. It's how we refill our cups. It's how we have essence to give others love. Play is not a luxury, as I've, as I've said before. So this idea that we have to do, produce, and achieve, we have to let that go if we want to merge the spiritual with the mundane. We have to stop forcing our will to get things done to prove our worth, that we're enough, okay, that these things are not mutually exclusive. We are enough. We are enough. You are enough. You do not have to do anything. So I found that when I started to really accept <laughs> that I needed to play, um, I started to receive energy again. I started to receive insight and creativity. And I was able to let go of a lot of programming. So programming was able to be released in that regard. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Some days I'll still be forcing myself to tick off a list and I'll, I, I will wake up from that sleep state because it, it's a program, programmed state. And I'll go, oh, 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 I'm forcing my will here. I need to go out and create and, and I, I need to go out and just be, I need to be. So today in particular, I took my shoes off and I went down to the beach. It started raining, but it didn't matter. The moment my feet hit the sand and I smelt that fresh bre um, breeze from the water, I felt re-energized because I could, I could move into the essence of play. I wasn't in the work position. I repositioned myself. I reframed my perception. I stepped out of the office um, position and moved into the, the the nature beach position and my lens changed back to play back to experiencing life from um, a lens of love of appreciation of gratitude for what is here now and of course one of the biggest things that I needed to embrace in my life and make it a ritual to merge the spiritual with the mundane was stillness. Stillness, if you really want to like 
break it down to its essence in a practical sense is taking big, deep belly breaths throughout the day. And it's interesting. I, um, I've talked to a client recently about this. A lot of us have been trained when we feel depressed or anxious to go to the GP to be prescribed something to take the pain away. And when I suggest that perhaps you are breathing shallow most of the time, perhaps there's a program habit there that has kept you in the shallow chest breathing, which keeps us in survival mode. It keeps us in fight, flight, freeze. It keeps us from accessing deep, calm, logical thoughts. And so perhaps the simplicity of just changing the way you're breathing and making it a new habit, remembering that it takes about 66 days on average to create a new neurological habit. 21 days if you're very, very strict with it every day, but at average 66 days, so a couple months. But most people find that too simplistic. Oh, no, no, deep breathing. No, I've got to go to the GP. I've got to, I've got to be prescribed. And so I want to emphasize how important it is to at least give it a go if you are finding yourself thinking about wanting help for anxiety or depression or stress try deep breathing okay so this has been a game changer in my life because i was for 10 years i was on and off antidepressants before i was aware and awake and conscious i bought into that and i became I don't believe I really needed it. I believe it was prescribed to me because that was all that was kind of done at the time. Um, and I believe that everything has happened in my life for a reason at the same time. However, it put me in a very sleep-like state for 10 years where I could have been developing new habits such as deep breathing. So for me, the, the merging of the spiritual with the mundane and, and recognizing that you can chop wood and carry water and be enlightened and, and be in such peace and shakeable inner peace is this recognition that you are the only one who can change the way that you approach life. You can't, you can't give this responsibility away to anyone, including the doctors. You, you can't, um, you've got to stop giving your power away. And, you know, I say that with caution. If you seriously need to look after your health, then get external advice. But if it's about anxiety and stress and depression, at least give deep breathing a go first. Okay. So I don't want to give um, health advice. I'm simply saying, have you considered deep breathing? Okay. Game changer. Game changer. Give it a go. 66 days. Put it in a calendar. Tick off every day. Make it at three points in each day when you wake up, when you're about to eat lunch, and just before you're about to go to sleep. Do some deep belly breaths and watch what happens to your life. So this enables you to stop living in survival mode and be able to start moving into that balance, 50-50 balance of the sacred in life. And sacred includes things like play and play includes things like dancing and singing and being silly and um, socializing with people and just for the fun of it not to be productive and um, uh, playing with animals and children and just for no other reason but to experience the pure delight of this part of life the sacred part of life this is what energizes us. This is what brings us into mystical experiences too. So a huge, huge part of um, integrating ourselves, embodying our higher selves into this life is recognizing that we are the only ones who can take care of ourselves. We've got to stop giving our power away. And so Often a big um, test is how much do you actually love yourself? And I'm, talk I'm not talking about that kind of vain love. I'm talking about self-nurture, self-care, the kind of love that says, hey, 
I'm a bit tired. I might cancel that engagement with this, with the, the social outing because I need some quiet time, some solo time. Or, hey, I, I'm working too hard today. It's been 10 hours of straight work. Tomorrow I'm going to start later. I'm going to give myself a long sleep. Or, hey, I'm thirsty. I need to stop and have a drink. You know, it can get really, some of us, a lot of us, and I was one of these people who have completely neglected ourselves through trauma and many other reasons, but trauma essentially where we abandon ourselves. So that's what we were taught to do by our caregivers. And so we never learn to attune to our own needs. So recognizing that you're the only one who can attune to your own needs, can't give that away to anyone else, and that it is a process. It's healing the nervous system. The nervous system is designed to um, flow energy in and out without any blockages, but we block our nervous system with trauma and we are unable to attune to our own needs. So it starts with the deep breathing so that we can stop living in survival mode and actually check in with ourselves. And then it's important to really listen to our own inner child. Are we thirsty? Are we hungry? Are we tired? Just the basics. A lot of us are missing the basics. How can we be at peace if we don't listen and attune to our own internal needs, our internal guidance system? If you are chasing peace and you haven't first stopped and gone within, then you must do that because no one else can save you except for you as a sovereign choice, you get to choose to take care of you. And so this will change your perception because you'll recognize that the, the change in you of taking care of you means that you have an increased capacity and magnetic influence on those around you. You honor yourself and give permission to everyone around you to do the same. Can you imagine a world where we all really nurture and care for ourselves? Recognizing that when we do that at a place of unity consciousness, that we are caring for others too. The world would be indeed a peaceful place. And finally, I found that this integration of the spiritual with the mundane had to include returning to that place of wonder and awe about the reality that I'm in. I recently got a new kitten. She's five months old and she's, like any kitten, absolutely adorable. And I just like watching her. She is so full of beans. She has this unlimited dynamic energy. And I believe a big part of it is because everything is new to her. She hasn't been taught labels. She hasn't been taught in consequence judgment because she hasn't labeled anything, so she can't judge anything. Every phenomena around her is interesting. The sound of cars the sound of birds, the sound of a seed hitting the ground, um, the, the splash of the shower against the, 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 um, the glass, uh, the drip of the tap, um, the cacophony of noises when a whole group of people are around, and then the tick of the clock when no one else is around. Everything is, is new and beautiful because there is no labeling of good or bad, right or wrong. It's just purely impulsive, nat natural way of being. This is where children are before they are conditioned and socialized into labeling. And this is where we can be too. I believe that 
we can return to this state of wonder and awe again if we start to practice new habits of perception. Whenever we catch ourselves labeling something or preferencing something or judging something or critiquing something, we can catch ourselves using our awareness. We can catch ourselves and we can change that. We can interfere with that and disrupt that pattern. And over time, it will become a new way of being, which is something I'm witnessing in my own life. Things don't bother you as much. There is a peacefulness in the mundane. There is a peacefulness in chopping wood and carrying water. There is a peacefulness in cooking dinner, doing the dishes, driving to work. There is wonder and awe again. There is no anxiety because if you return to the natural state of a child, you're not living in tomorrow. You're not thinking of tomorrow. And so you're not projecting any fears or worries into tomorrow. Children don't have that experience yet. And you don't need to either. And this is what stopping doing and starting being more is about. We need to return to presence without intention. Pure presence has no intention. And that's why the mundane can be so beautiful again. I believe that we have been fed a lot of stories about what um, will be fulfilling in our lives. And I think very few of us reach that level of fulfillment. It becomes an insatiable habitual drive that inhabits us, a program that drives us, a never-ending finish line. That is all just false illusion and we don't need it. And that's how we can release ourselves from the program of doing and recognize that being is far more fulfilling. And it is nothing to do with accumulating wealth or um, uh, becoming popular or um, having the house or the, the career, it has nothing to do with any of these things. And I don't need to remind you that people who achieve those things still are not satiated. If we can practice all of these things, so acceptance of our shadows, stepping out of our doing programming and just learning to be into presence without intention, becoming still and practicing the deep breath of presence, moving into our life that is more about deep logical thoughts rather than shallow survival thoughts and moving into play. When we can make ourselves over time remember that we are part of a whole to take care of ourselves, which will have massive effects on the whole, when we see the world as a childhood again, with wonder and awe, when we stop labelling and judging and critiquing, this is when life becomes truly beautiful in the mundane. And this, to me, is the spiritual walk. It's not about a mystical, magical, explosive daily experience, in my opinion. Hey, if this has been your experience, I'd love to hear about it. But from what I've seen and, and those I've talked to about this, it's the chop wood carry water, peacefulness. That is true. That is the truth. And when we stop resisting and fighting the ordinary and the mundane, then we stop making it so tedious and boring. It starts to become a magical dance in itself. And when we stop making it about our self being successful in the world's eyes and we make it about supporting each other, recognising that each other and ourselves are the whole, 
we are together in this. That is that is fulfilling. That is truly fulfilling. And you don't have the same pressure because it's not a competition anymore. There's no competition. That's illusion. Competition and scarcity are just illusory experiences that people make up. They're programs. That's not how it works. We operate with frequency, with attunement. So are you attuned to a frequency of unity, consciousness, of love, of support, of being, of presence? If you are, then you'll know what I'm talking about. And it's a journey, as I always say. It's not going to happen overnight, but it, it gets better and better. And it's worth it. So I would encourage you to, to look at things in your life and, and just consciously evaluate where you might be fighting the mundane in order to be spiritual because they're not mutually exclusive. 